Hi everybody, um, welcome. I'm Emma. I'm going to be giving you uh, a talk this evening on an introduction to bird identification. I must just let you all know before I start that I'm sharing my screen in full view mode at the moment, which means that I can't see any of you, any of you um, and I can't see the chat at the moment either. Um, so if you do have any questions um, as we go through, please feel free just to unmute yourself and just jump in with a question. That's absolutely fine. However, if you prefer to type a message for question, please use the chat function. Uh, and write down a message and then at the end of the presentation I'll review that chat function um, to, um, to see if there's any questions that are left to be answered um, and if anybody um, is struggling to hear me or can't see me particularly well please do um, just get like I say pop yourself off mute and just let me know. So we're looking to take about an hour and a half no more than that hoping to be finished by 7 30 so you can all get on with your evenings but welcome to see so many people here this evening. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know um, who we are here at the Wildlife Trust, um, we're a local charity. Um, we work for Nature's Recovery all across Birmingham and the Black Country. And um, we know we have some people um, on the call today who are local and some from further afield. So welcome to all of you. You're all very welcome to this talk. Um, if, you, if you do or you don't know about much about us, I'll just give you a brief introduction. So we lead hundreds of partners and community groups to protect, create and improve wildlife rich green spaces to connect people and wildlife. Um, and, our real, and our vision really is for Birmingham the Black Country to have more wildlife and more wild places um, and to, to give people a stronger connection to the natural world every year. Um, now, just a little bit about what we do. So um, we manage um, six different nature reserves uh, and we manage two different education centres. Um, so those reserves and education centres that are all pictured here um, on, on the slide for you, um, from Mosley Park in Birmingham uh, to Peascroftwood over in Wolverhampton. A wide range of different sizes uh, and habitats of nature reserves, just part of the work that we do here. Okay, so on with the talk. So this evening we are here to learn some basics about bird identification. So I must say, um, I am not an ecologist, I am not a conservationist, I am purely a bird enthusiast. Um, I actually work um, in the fundraising and communications department at the Trust. Um, it just happens to have a very keen interest in birds. Um, so this presentation this evening um, is to help give you some tips and some, um, some ideas around how to identify some of the birds that you might see out and about locally or more further afield when you're exploring or when you're on holiday. And um, so as at the start, um, it's a very interactive workshop and talk this evening. So please feel free to join in and un unmute yourselves um, and ask questions. Uh, I will be testing people on their knowledge as we go. So if you think you know what a species is, please feel free to, to shout out. That's, that's great, we do want some interaction. Okay, so the first thing we're going to start looking at this evening is about size and shape and silhouette. Sometimes when we're looking at birds, they, um, we only really get a sense of them by their size. So we might be looking at a very, very small bird such as our very familiar robin here, for example. Um, and birds can vary completely in size, all the way up to quite large birds with very long necks and very long wings and very long beaks, such as this grey heron here. However, sometimes we don't always get the opportunity to watch birds when they are sitting nice and still, like a heron is when it's waiting patiently to find its prey, or like a friendly robin in our garden that's sitting and perched looking more lovely and cute for us, for us to watch uh, or is the, the very familiar wood pigeon here in this image. Sometimes the birds that we're looking at can be way up in the sky and sometimes all we see is the outline or the silhouette of the bird. And so the three other photographs here on the slide for you and um, just to give you some top tips of when you're looking up at some of the, at the shapes and silhouettes that you might see to help you with identification. So we're going to start off here on the top left of the screen. So this large bird is a, is, is a part of the crow family. It has a large bill 
and it also has a tail that is almost diamond shape. Does anybody know what this species is here? If anybody wants to wants to jump in and tell me if they know what this is, and if not, I'll just reveal it. Okay, so this is a raven. It's what it's our one of our it's our largest crow. Um, and that's one of the, the good tips to look for it if you do happen to see it only in silhouette or if you're looking up for it. Sometimes you can't really gauge the size of a bird when you're looking up. But if you happen to see a raven next to another bird, so next to a carrion crow, for example, you can really see that they are quite significantly bigger. And looking for that diamond shape in the tail is a really good tip for helping to identify a raven. Now, moving to this image in the middle here, um, another silhouetted bird. So there's almost no colour at all here. We can just simply see the outline. And this bird can often be seen hovering over fields or hovering at roadsides. Does anybody know what this might be here? A nice pointed hooked bill here. Is it a kestrel? It is a kestrel, yeah, absolutely. So again, another tip here, you're looking at the shape and the silhouette of a bird um, is sometimes the shape of its wings and where it's, where it's looking, for example. So this is absolutely is a kestrel. So sometimes you don't necessarily need the colour or a really fantastic view to be able to successfully identify a bird. And the last one here on the right hand side, quite a large bird. We do have quite a bit of colour here. Uh, so we have lots of brown, some white, white into the un underwing and a fanned out tail, quite what we call forked, forked feathers. And if you know what this one is here. Buzzard. It is a buzzard. Yes, it absolutely is a buzzard. So a large bird large wingspan and you'll quite often see them sort of soaring and they will catch a thermal they look very relaxed as they're soaring and starting to get onto the increase now in our urban areas again and another tip for you is to look for color so if you have an opportunity where you you spotted the bird in your garden or at your local park um, do keep an eye out for the, for the colour, because the colour can be a real telltale indicator um, for helping you to, to identify that species. Um, and at first glance, um, a lot of our birds can look, uh, from, you know, from a distance, quite brown or quite dull. Um, but actually, there is quite a lot of colour um, in, in some of our really familiar bird species. And I've picked three out here just as examples for you. So this top bird here um, has a small pointed beak. Um, it has a very red face, looks like it's had its head in a tin of paint, and it has this gorgeous gold band here on its wing. Beautiful colours and spotted white dots on the feathers. Does anybody know what this bird here is? This is a goldfinch, so the clues here in this band of gold on, it, on its wing. Uh, and they're very, very beautiful, very colourful birds. Um, very chattery as well. So another sign to look out for with goldfinches. They're very chattery, especially when they're flying overhead. But beautiful colours. They can just, just be very dull at a distance, but they have some wonderful colours. And again here, another bird that at first glance would look very brown and potentially quite dull. It actually has this sort of speckled egg effect on its head and this gorgeous patch of blue here in its wing. Now, this is another bird that's part of the crow family. Does anybody know what this bird is? We might spot it in, in woodlands. It likes to bury acorns. Jay? It is a jay, yes, absolutely. So again, really colourful. Just looking out for that blue flash on the wing as they're flying past can be a real, a real um, a sign for, for identifying them. And then one of my favourites here on the right-hand side, um, again, at first glance, it can look very dull. Sometimes they can appear completely black or completely brown. Uh, but as this picture shows us, they have actually got quite a lot of colour in their feathers from this beautiful range of purple here to this shimmering green. Um, anybody know this, this particular bird? Quite a, quite, a, quite a common one. Starling. It is a starling, yeah, it is a starling. They're really colourful. When the sunlight catches them, they glimmer. They're absolutely wonderful. Now this is a, this is just for a bit of fun. This slide, um, but it's to it's to kind of give you an insight really into how colour alone can help us um, with bird identification. So this is a fun quiz um, that um, that I saw doing the rounds on social media a couple of years ago. And I thought, oh, I love this. This is great. What a, what a great um, 
what a great opportunity here just to have a little look at uh, birds in from a different perspective and look at their colours only and identify them purely from their colours. So I'm going to pick a couple out here um, and just see if we can maybe work out what these species are purely by looking at the colours alone. I'm going to pick it out for starters, E3. So E3, we have a number of different colours here. We've got some sort of sandy coloured, gold colours, some very bright blue and a patch of black. Does anybody think what the, this might be in the UK? Kingfisher? Kingfisher, yeah, I was two answering at once. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see that just by the colour alone, you know, sometimes the bird will flash past your eyes and you don't necessarily always get a sense of the size or the shape of it. And sometimes you might be you're just getting a, a sense of that colour, that flash of colour that flies past you. So, so I love this. I love this, um, this quiz. This one's great. Um, let's pick another one out. So how about uh, how about D5? So lots of lots of different shades of brown and then this almost emerald green colour. Any thoughts on what this one might be? Mallard. Yeah, absolutely, a mallard. I won't go through them all, but um, I can. I will share these slides um, after with you, with you all. Um, just a bit of bit of fun, really, to to um, to look at colours. I'm going to do one more, just one more. So I'm going to do um, A3. So we've got some black, some grey, some white, and then a couple of different shades of red. Red spotted woodpecker. Oh, amazing. You guys are great at this. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so is this just to illustrate to you if you have only got that flash of colour um, to look out for? That can be a really useful identification tool. Now, I've got a few videos that will hopefully play for you. Um, but these are just to give you an indication of behaviour. So um, or the way that a bird is behaving, either behaving um, in terms of the way it's feeding, um, it, where it's positioned uh, on, in, in its habitat, uh, the way it's interacting with other birds, or the way it's just interacting um, with, with, it, with its actual environment. So I'm going to show you a few little videos here, so I do hope you can see them. So we're going to start off with a dunnock. Hope you can all see that. A very overlooked bird, I think, the dunnock. It has a lovely little flick to its tail when it's busying around in the garden. Very similar to a sparrow. It has a very grey head and what I like to think of as quite grey eyebrows as well. And its behaviour is quite skulky, I would describe it as. They, they tend to be quite lonesome birds, so you will quite often see them on their own. Um, they're usually pecking around at the ground or pecking around. You see them in your garden, they might be busying around your plant pots in your garden or busying around in the bushes and shrubs. So that's a good tip there for the behaviour of this bird. You might see it out on its own um, in the trees. Also has a beautiful song. Not a bird that you will see um, in big flocks, uh, a bird that you'll very, very often see just on its own. Let's have a little potter around, maybe a little flick of that tail. And you can also listen out for its beautiful song as well. So that's the dunnock. Now let's have a look at a bird that behaves in a completely different way. I do apologise. I managed to somehow stop the report, stop the the, the um, video there for you halfway through playing. Let me see if I can get it back to where it was for you all. As 
you can see there in um, that rather amusing video, I think, of, uh, of the nut hatch uh, is in the way in which it behaves. Again, you'll quite often see them um, alone. Sometimes, sometimes you'll see them in, in pairs, um, but their behavior is quite unique. So they have this almost sort of hopping, hopping action. Um, but they climb both up and down the, 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 the bark of the tree. Um, so you, they can sometimes um, be confused with tree creepers, which are which do behave in a similar way. But the tree creeper can only go up the tree. The nuthatch has the ability to go both head first down uh, the trunk of a tree and also up a tree as well. And I like to think of it as having a bit of a Zorro mask on with its black black band uh, across the eyes. So if you're out and about either in your garden or in local parks and you see a bird heading head first down the trunk of a tree, chances are from the way it's behaving that you can get a sense that it's very likely to be a nut hatch. So we looked at kestrels when we looked at silhouettes on the previous slide, um, but I do have a little short video. Um, again, these, these videos um, are from YouTube, so they're not my videos, they're not my credits. Um, but I just I found these and they um, from most of them from an urban area and I, uh, I really liked how they demonstrated the behaviour of the bird. So this one was actually filmed at Birmingham Airport um, and you can really get a sense of the way in which the Kestrel's behaving here. It's completely motionless in its body. There's tail feathers stretched out for balance. Just the wings flapping away there. And this is quite often the view that we'll get of a kestrel. We're quite often quite far away from it. Unless we've got a super wonderful zoom lens on that camera or a great pair of binoculars. So this is a good tip for having a, having a look at if you see that bird that's really hovering there like that. And then just a bit of a dive down, very likely to be kestrel. And now again, we looked at starlings on the previous page when we, when we were talking about colour to help identify birds through colour. Um, but they're also very cheeky birds as well. They're very, um, very full of character. So let's have a look at these starlings. So you can see there, they're all chattering away. They like to hang out, they're very social birds. Uh, and as you can see there, this is a supermarket car park. <laughs> so you will quite often see birds like starling. So quite opportunistic they will take advantage. They're very alert birds, they're very social, they're very chattery. I like to talk to each other while they're having a bit of a preen. Um, and, a, and a really easy urban bird to spot. You, know, you might be lucky enough to have them visiting your garden. I sadly never get any starlings in my garden, um, but they're fantastic and really easy to identify with the way that they behave. Um, now, another way to identify birds, obviously, is listening to them. So birds do have uh, a wide range of different, different calls and they use their calls um, to attract mates. They use their calls to, um, to raise the alarm about a potential predator nearby. And they do that in lots of different ways. Um, and birds make lots of different, different calls. And some birds have a variety, a, a huge variety of calls just themselves as well. And I have put on the screen here the, the website that these birds, um, bird songs have all taken from, which is a great website that um, provides information about the different range of the, the different variety of bird songs so from their mating calls and their alarm calls and their different contact calls to stay in touch with one another so the answers are going to come up when I click these <laughs> so I'll test your knowledge on um on the, the shape uh, the size and the color of these birds before we go on to their songs so does anybody want to tell me what the top bird here is So this one is a blackbird, it's a female blackbird. So the males are completely black and the females are, and the juveniles as well are also very brown. So let's just have a click on this and hopefully you'll be able to hear um, the blackbird having a nice sing. Let's see if this one works. It might just take a second to open. Here we go.
lots of squeaks and whistles. You quite often hear the blackbirds calling um, at dusk as well. A great dusk, dusk bird to listen to as you're finishing up in the garden of an evening. Really soothing song, I think, the, the blackbird. That, hopefully that's one you will recognise. How about this, this bird here? Um, it's quite pale on the underneath. It has an yellow eye stray, very brownish, greenish feathers. Visits us all the way from Africa. I don't know this one before we play its song. It's a now, it is a chiff chaff. Yeah, absolutely. Now this bird literally sings its name <laughs> so i'll let you have a listen to this one and you can get uh, you can have a think about whether you may have heard this because they've, they've not long arrived back in the back in the uk um and they mark their arrival by singing their song so let's take a listen to this one I'm not hearing it. Can you not hear that at all? No, I couldn't hear the blackbird. I wasn't sure if it was an error. But I Oh, is there anybody it. else on the call that can't hear it? Yep, I can't hear it. I yeah. can't hear it. Yeah. I can't, oh, I can't oh. hear it. Oh, thank you all for letting me know. I've just been sat here enjoying the bird song on my own. Okay, let me see if I can do something else <laughs> to see if you can hear it. Wait a minute. You can hear it then. You can hear it now. Yes. Ah, okay. Excellent. Thank you. So you can hear it singing its name. It's singing chiff, chiff, chaff, chiff, chaff, chiff, chaff. Is this a bird that you've all heard recently, a bird you're familiar with? Let's pop the let's try and pop the blackbird back on. I should didn't get to hear that. I just closed the chiff chaff down and then I'll just give you another play of the blackbird and hopefully you'll be able to hear it this time. You'll hear that this time. Yeah. So I was describing to you as I was saying it before, it's a lovely fluty song, <laughs> you couldn't actually hear it, so now you do get a sense of it's lovely fluty song. Okay, uh, I'm going to go on to another one now then. So this is one of the birds that we identified um, from the colours exercise. So the black, the white, the red, it's a great spotted woodpecker. And you can quite often hear this bird by the drumming that it does onto the trunk of the tree. Let's see if we can get this one to play for you. <laughs> Let's see if this one will work. And you will hear that, that drumming sound. It reminds me yeah. of when you were at school and you used to bring a ruler off the edge of the table. Great spotted woodpecker drumming on the on the trunk of a tree. For those of you that are joining the meeting um, ahead of the, the very, very start, um, I can't see you all whilst I'm presenting. So if you do have any questions or any issues um, with you actually being able to see or hear the presentation, please just do unmute yourselves and um, I'll be able to sort these out for you. Okay, so another, another woodpecker now here. Uh, so this one is the green woodpecker. So called cool because it is green. It's a much larger woodpecker than the great spotted woodpecker. It has a, this lovely black cap. 
a bit like it's wearing a baseball cap backwards, lovely green feathers. Um, and this bird's call is known as a yaffle. So I'll see if we can play this one for you. Do shout them if you can't hear it. I'll let you know when I press play and let me know if you can't hear it. That's quite similar to a high pitched laugh, I think, the, the, the yaffle. It can be quite, um, give you a bit of a start sometimes as you're walking through the woods uh, and, and you hear you hear that, that yaffle of the woodpecker. It's, um, it's quite distinctive. Um, this bird here um, is uh, one of our thrushes. This is a song thrush. Uh, it has a beautiful song. Um, it's a very repetitive call. Uh, I was actually um, out taking a walk yesterday evening after work and I, um, in, in a wood nearby to me and I, um, I heard a song calling and it was beautiful and if you're not familiar with their song because they've got a repetitive mimicking sound it can almost sound like you're listening to a number of different birds all singing in succession but it's actually just this one just this one bird it's quite a petite bird it's a fairly similar size to um, a blackbird um, and you can differentiate the, um, the song thrush from the missile thrush, which is also very similar. Um, the song thrush on its tummy has these speckles on, speckles on them, and they look like sort of upwards pointing arrows. Um, it has, uh, it's a little bit smaller as well, which is another way to identify it. Whereas the missile thrush has, has um, a mottled tummy, but they're more blotchy. So another little tip there for you, if you're not sure if you're looking at a missile thrush, or a song thrush. The song thrush has got the pointy arrows and the missile thrush has got more of the blotches. And let's see if I can get this one to play for you because I really love the song thrush. It's cool. So you can hear that, repet that repetition, almost two songs, and then it moves on, and it's another two songs. It's just that one bird singing. Beautiful, beautiful to be able to hear it in the woods of, a, of an evening. It's a now to a bird that's really quite different. So. This next bird that I'm going to play the song for you um, is a summer migrant. It arrives with us here in the summer months. I am trying to get the song to us to stop singing. <laughs> it wants to continue in the background. Um, this, um, this bird is a swift and swift scream. So you will hear them. You might, you might be lucky enough to have them uh, nesting on um, houses nearby to you. And they have a gorgeous scream as they fly through. I'm going to see if I can get the... The song's quiet now and we'll listen to the listen to the swift screaming. Did you all catch that that high pitched scream uh, of, of the swift? So I'm lucky enough to um where I am from my flat window with working from home regularly especially during the lockdown um this, there are two swift nests on my street and i'm very lucky enough to be able to see both <laughs> swift nests from my flat window um so i get the wonderful experiences of not only screaming round in the summer and like gorgeous it's, it's just that sense that summer's here when you can hear the swift screaming but um to also be able to see them are going in and out of their nests as well and they're, they're fantastic birds. They do absolutely everything on the wing. They are not ground dwelling birds at all. In fact, the only time they actually ever stop flying is to nest. Um, they can actually get into quite a lot of trouble if they become grounded. Um, they, they, um, they are very precarious on the ground. If you ever do find a grounded, a, a grounded uh, swift, you need to take it, hold it up high up into the air so it can 
so they can take off again. They're not ground birds at all, but they they, they sleep on the wing. They, they eat on the wing. They mate on the wing. They are wonderful birds. So do listen out for um, their screams over the summer months. And um, if you are lucky enough to have them um, in your local neighbourhood, then um, now's a great time of the year before they start to arrive back to think about popping up habitat boxes for them. You can get very specific swift nest boxes um, to pop up and they like big nests really quite high up on top of the houses. Now the last one on this again is a really another really common bird. Um, so it's a, it's a, one of our smaller birds. We might see this in our gardens. We'll quite often see this bird um, hopping around bird tables and on the bird feeders. Um, it's very small, it's very yellow on the front. It has what I like to think of as a bit of a shirt collar and a tie going on here and a completely black head. Um, this bird is the great tit. So I'm going to play this bird's call for you. All being well. <laughs> Let's see if it opens for us. quite a high-pitched call. Now, um, a colleague of mine once described the great tits call as um, sounding like somebody using an old-fashioned foot pump to blow up a camping airbed. <laughs> And um, that, that really that stayed that really stayed with me. That description of the great tit really just sound like a squeaky football. <laughs> so hopefully those are bird songs um, that you know that you you may have heard before. And if you haven't heard them before, uh, then hopefully um, this will give you some insight into um, some identification tips, just purely through listening out to birds. Um, and one of my favourite things to do is to just completely immerse myself in bird song. I absolutely love doing that. Um, and it's OK not to know as well. It's OK if you hear a bird and you don't necessarily know what it is. Um, I spent ages last night at the woods trying to work out what a bird was. It turned out to be a chaffinch. And I was really quite disappointed when I found out. I thought, oh, I don't recognise this call. It might be something really exotic. It turned out it was a, uh, it was a chaffinch, just a different call that I just didn't happen to, to recognise. But... Sometimes, you know, you can just use your senses. So we've talked about looking and we've talked about looking at the colours, looking at the shape, getting an idea of the size. Um, but you can use our, we can use our other senses as well. And we can we can just sometimes just close our eyes and just listen into the bird song. And sometimes we're closing your eyes and just listening and it gets you a, a bit of a sense of direction of where the bird song is coming from. It might help you to direct yourself to go and have a better look to see if you can get that identification. But thinking about where the bird actually is in terms of its location um, is another thing to bear in mind when we're trying to identify birds. So that could include where it is, so in terms of the type of habitat that it's in. Now, birds do have a tendency to just turn up pretty much anywhere unexpectedly, but you can generally use a rule of thumb about if you see a bird in a coastal area, then it's not likely to be you're not likely to be seen in a city area, for example, or in an urban area. It doesn't always apply like that because birds do appear in strange places. But the bird's habitat can be a good tip to sort of think about oh, what kind of birds might I see here? So we'll start off with the bottom left here. So uh, birds on the bottom left here is another spring summer migrant um, to, um, to the UK and to Europe. Um, it is completely white on the tummy and has these gorgeous tropical streamers here on the tail feathers. Um, and it fly, I like to think of them as like day flying bats. They really fast, they're very, very um, aerodynamic and they eat, they eat flies um, on the wings. Does anybody know what this bird is on the bottom left? A swallow? Yes, it's a swallow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thinking about the kind of habitat that, that you might see a swallow in, it's very unlikely that you'll see them in very, very urban areas. Doesn't mean you won't ever see them, but very unlikely. Um, they're known as barn swallows. So you quite often see them in fields where there are barns, for example, they use mud to make their nests. Um, when I went on a walk yesterday evening, I got out of the car and I thought, hmm, this looks like the right spot for a swallow. And as soon as I said that, I looked and there was a swallow, there was some swallows flying around. 
So sometimes, you know, just using that sense of where you are and what kind of habitat you are can really help with getting a sense of what birds you might see and helping you with that identification. Yeah, so you do tend to often see um, swallows around fields. Uh, you can get them at, at, at parks as well, uh, especially at parks where there's water. They like to skim the surface of the water to catch the flies. Um, and they like grass, long grasslands as well to eat flies. The other thing to think about as well is the, the time of the day and the time of the year as well. You know, so some birds might be more active at night, so like owls, for example. Um, and that doesn't mean that you will never see an owl during the day. You will, you will sometimes see owls during the day, particularly little owls are much more active during the day. Uh, barn owls tend to be much more um, active during the evening. But this tawny owl here, I think a little, little uh, hop. A little, little look out of its nest here is clearly a daylight image. Sometimes you will see them during the daytime, but more often than not, if you see quite a chunky bird flying around and it's dark, the likelihood is it's quite likely to be an owl. So usually the time of the day can be a good indicator for your identification as well. Now I mentioned migration when I was talking about the swallows. So the swallows migrate north, so they come from Africa up to the warmer countries. This bird here on the right hand side migrates south. So it moves away from the colder countries in Scandinavia and comes across down in big flocks in the winter. So these are what we call winter migrants. And this is a thrush. It's part of the thrush family. Um, and it has this patch of red under its wing here. Now, knowing that it has this patch of red under its wing, might anybody hesitate a guess of what this bird is called? Red wing? It is a red wing, yes, absolutely. I love birds that are called what they look like, they're easy to remember. So it has this beautiful little patch, almost like his armpit area under its, under its wing. Um, so thinking about the time of year, quite likely that you'll see these in the winter months. They've usually all gone back to Scandinavia um, in the summer months. Um, and they like, um, they like trees, they like fields, they like to feed in what we call mixed flocks so they will like they will hang out with field fairs uh, and they will feed together on berries so you'll quite often see them um, high up in trees we will see them on fields as well so they're a winter migrant now birds that you um can see in a number of different places um but one bird that is um quite notorious with urban areas is this bird of prey up here on the top right hand side so this bird of prey has a big moustache and it has bright yellow legs and it has a bright yellow bill and bright yellow rings around its eyes. But from underneath, it's really rather stripy and it's very grey on top. It's also the fastest bird in the UK as well. We can see this bird um, quite often in urban areas. Um, so I know that these birds um, frequent Birmingham city centre. Um, and they also can be spotted in Warsaw as well. Um, and uh, I've seen them over just over the border in Staffordshire at Bagridge Country Park, for example. Now, these birds are peregrine falcons. So these are birds of prey. You will see them in coastal areas. You will see them in very rural areas. You can also see them in very urban areas. So it is definitely always worth, if you're walking through, um, even if it's a busy town centre or a busy city centre like Birmingham or in Worcester, for example, where they are, they like really tall buildings and they particularly like old church buildings because the, 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 the materials that they're made from resemble the natural rock structures that they would naturally nest on. So it's always just worth having a look up, look up to those tall buildings. It might just be a peregrine falcon just peering out, waiting for an unsuspecting pigeon to... to um, to fly by, to grab its dinner on the wing. So you can see these birds in lots of different areas, but we are lucky enough to be able to see them in, in, in very urban areas. Now, another bird here uh, that is uh, named after its behaviour and named after what it looks like. So it's, um, it is predominantly grey. It has a yellow bottom, but it's predominantly grey. And it likes to wag its tail. <laughs> so no clues really. We're guessing that this is a wagtail and it is a grey wagtail. So it's predominantly grey and it wags its tail. So its behaviour is a good is a good sign to uh, identify it. If you see a bird that's wandering around, really giving that tail a good old wag, 
usually got a mouthful of grubs as well. Here it's got a mouthful of spiders by the look of it. Um, but these birds, um, they're like waterways. They're not that bothered about clean waterways. So you can quite often see birds like wagtails in really quite grimy, grimy streams, and sometimes even in gutters. Of insect. So again, that's another sort of clue when it comes to the location. You look for birds like wagtails if you need to need some running water or stagnant water. Now this last bird is predominantly associated with the coast, as you can see here from the image. It's on a, on a rocky shore here. Um, it's what we call a wading bird. It has long legs, so it can wade through, wade through the mud and wade through the, the shoreline. Um, it's quite just quite chunky bird. Has a beautiful bright red eye and it's a long red bill that you used to probe down into the sand um, to get invertebrates out of the sand. Does anyone know what this bird is? Oyster catcher. Oh, yeah, also, also there was two of you going for it at the same time there. Yes, it is an oyster catcher. Yeah, they are wonderful, wonderful characteristic birds that you'll quite often see um, in coastal areas. Um, but then you do see them inland as well, so anywhere where there are wetlands, for example. You might you might see an oyster catcher rock up. That's location covered. Um, oh no, it's not location covered. I have another slide on location. Um, another, another another few tips for you when it comes to uh, to location is is where birds tend to place their nests, and they're not always very traditional when it comes to where they place their nests. As some of these images on the screen will show you. Uh, they will take advantage and sometimes build their nests in really quite precarious um, areas. Um, at my parents' house, they have um, a family of, of starling who make their nests in the um, overflow pipe every year. <laughs> they have to, they're constantly biting their nails thinking, oh God, I hope the birds don't get washed out of the overflow, overflow pipe the hole and they can, they can get in and make their nest. But here you can see a, a collared dove that's made its nest here. On the back of two CCTV cameras, it's precariously placed its twigs to make its nest. Um, and here's some examples of a number of different um, song thrush here, all making their nests um, where they where they see fit. And I guess actually the traffic light is probably actually surprisingly a sensible place to nest. I could imagine it's probably very warm against the against the light bulb there, so keeping those chicks lovely and warm and helping them to. To grow nice and strong and of course the shape of that traffic light there is a nice sort of natural nesting space to take some nesting material into um, as our guttering uh, here as well as you can see so looking for nesting is a look, looking for nests is absolutely fantastic but sometimes as i mentioned earlier birds can just turn up where you absolutely least expect them to um, and uh, our friends uh, bird watch actually Prefer and presenter David Lindo, um, his catchphrase is to look up, always just look up. And he, he tells us that birds can turn up anywhere at any time. They don't necessarily always follow the rules. And sometimes birds can turn up anywhere at any time um, because um, they are looking for new territories. Uh, and sometimes that can be because they have been um, basically, uh, they have gone a little bit lost. They may have been caught up into a storm and you might find a, a seabird that's been blown into blown in shore, for example, or a migrant that's been caught up in a storm and been swept somewhere across. So the, the rules are there to give you some guidance, but the, the birds don't necessarily always play by them. And one example I've included here um, is another bird of prey. So this is bird of prey. Not the best photograph of it, I'm afraid, unfortunately, but it has a, what we call a forked tail. So its tail is shaped in a fork. Um, it's very brown, but it has these beautiful grey and black patches and very black fingertips to the edges of its feathers, to the edges of its wing feathers here. And this is a red kite. Now, red kites uh, were in a lot of trouble in the UK, but there's been a number of different reintroduction uh, programmes, particularly over in Wales. Um, and although we don't have many red kites in Birmingham and the Black Country, we do occasionally see them. Um, looking for new territories or feeding. Um, I live in the Sourbridge area and I've seen red kites that came from my flat window twice, just on, on one occasion, just looked past and went, oh, there's a red kite. So sometimes, you know, birds can just show up in, 
in really unexpected um, situations. Um, and uh, sky watching is actually a thing a lot of bird watchers will just sit and just watch the skies. Birds will be flying past, and it can be a great way uh, to be a bit of a lazy bird watcher, I suppose, really. So I'm going to whiz through some common garden birds here for you and help you with some identification tips. So I've got to start off here with our tits. So there are four different common tits that we tend to see in our gardens and people can get them mixed and can get them confused. So I'm going to try and give you some tips just to try and help you to differentiate them from one another. So the first two that can quite easily get confused is the blue tit here on the top left and the great tit here on, on the right. When you see them photographed next to each other, you think, oh, they look very different. But actually in reality, they flit around quite fast in the tree and you just get this blurred color flying past you. And it can be quite difficult to, um, to, to really identify them. Um, the thing to look out for on the great tit is it's much darker. The colors are much, much deeper and much darker and the head is almost completely black whereas the blue tit's head is completely, is, is very pale blue and it's much lighter, much sort of paler colours on, on, the, on, the, um, on the chest here. Also a little bit smaller as well. Um, so looking out for a slightly smaller bird with slightly, um, slightly duller colours is likely to be the blue tit, really bold colours with a very, very black head. That's going to be your great tit. There's a bit of a size difference. The great tits are a, are a little bigger. You've got the blue tits are feeding on the feeder in your garden and the great tits come along. The blue tits will give way to the great tits because they're, they're, they're bigger. And the two that you um, might get occasionally confused between is the coal tit here on the left hand side and the long tailed tit here on the right. Now the long tailed tit is just one of my ultimate favorite birds. I just think it's like a hamster that's got wings. It's ridiculously cute. It's got this adorable little face. Um, it always looks like it's sort of been ruffled up, like it's just got out of its duvet. It's always got this straight out of bed look um, to me. It has got a very long tail. So that's a really good tip for looking out for the blue tits. If you see what you think is a hamster in a tree that can fly with a long tail, you've got yourself long tail tits. Now the coal tit here is a much shyer bird. Um, it's much smaller. Um, it's much paler. The colours are very sort of muted greys, muted brown. So there's none of the yellow that you would get on the, the blue tit or on the great tit. Um, but the head is very, very similar, as you can see, to the great tit. It has the black cap across and the white cheek here. Um, but the difference between the two birds is it's much smaller. It's a much shyer bird, much more skulky. It would hide away a little bit more. And it's much more muted in the colours, much lighter, paler greys. That's the four different tips that you'll see in the garden, hopefully. Now, this fellow here um, is sitting up on a roof, hanging out of some guttering. We might recognise this bird. They're quite noisy uh, when they're breeding. Now, these are our house sparrows. Now, house sparrows and tree sparrows, people can get quite mixed up. And how somebody taught me to remember it is that house sparrows have a grey head. And if we think about it, the roofs of our houses are grey. And that's how we can remember that the house sparrow has a grey head like the hats of our houses. And the tree sparrow has a brown head like the colour of the trees. So I hope that helps you to remember your tree sparrows from your house sparrows. Now we get quite a variety of different crows um, in our gardens, quite common, quite common garden birds. And these are just two that I've just picked out here for you. Um, just two of my favourite crows. So here we've got the very cheeky jackdaw. Um, last summer I um, saw some jackdaws very excitingly burying a jam sandwich in one of my plant pots. Um, they are really cheeky. They've got this, this, this so full of character, quite noisy and chatty. I've got a real, I've got a real liking for, for jackdaws. But you can tell the difference from the other crows. From from there, they've almost got like a hood up, like a grey hood. Their face, is, their face is black, but they've got this grey hood up. And our other crows, such as the carrion crow and the rook and the raven, they are completely black. So the, the, the jackdaw, quite a cheeky fella, got a grey hood on. You'll no doubt all recognise this bird here. And again, I think it's another one of our birds that's 
very overlooked. We can see it very often um, and we can just go, oh, yeah, just a magpie. We see them all the time. So I'd urge you next time you see a magpie to really, really have a look and really take a look at those colours that, that are in the feathers. They are so blue and iridescent and some of them even look purpley and green. Beautiful birds, quite a long tail as well, so it's quite, quite distinctive. Now, some of us might get birds hunting in our gardens. Um, so birds of prey that hunt other birds. Um, and this is the, the sparrow hawk, as you can see here from this photograph, sitting on a fence. Um, you can quite often uh, blink and miss a sparrow hawk. They are very, very silent. They are, are pretty fast flyers. Uh, if you're lucky enough to see one, you might just see one swoop on the side of your eye between some houses. Um, but if you've ever been lucky enough to watch one catch some prey, I haven't ever saw a sparrow hawk catch its prey. If you have, I'm very jealous. Um, but they will hunt around quite commonly um, around our urban areas and in our gardens, looking for uh, other birds, including blue tits and great tits and sparrows to feed on. Um, so they see our feeding stations that we put out in our gardens to feed the small birds, they see them as feeding stations too because they're providing the small birds to their dinner. Now who's seen these fellows around bottom right here? Give me a yay if you've seen these birds. Anybody spotted any of these in Birmingham in the Black Country recently or even further afield? Yeah. Yeah. Loads. Loads. Oh, loads. Oh, okay. I'm intrigued just to where the loads are. Tell me where you've been seeing them. It's very interesting. Wally Woods. Oh, that's where I've seen them too. Okay, yeah. Sandor Valley. Sandor Valley, yeah. Where else have we seen them? Hansworth Park. Hansworth. Oh, okay. Lisos Park. Lisos. So they're getting about, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> they really are getting about. Anhill Park. They fly over the top of King's Heath. Oh, do they? They're in King's Heath as well? Uh, yeah, Highbury oh. Park. 30 or 40 of them. Wow. Um, Woodgate and Valley. Someone's and Woodgate told me as well. out in the River Coal Valley out east, you find wow. them now. Oh, this is so interesting to hear where everybody's starting to see them. Um, so it sounds like some of you on the call are quite familiar with this bird then. So it's a ring-necked parakeet. Um, it's obviously not a bird that's, <laughs> that's meant to be here in the UK. It's a tropical bird, it's essentially a parrot. Um, but they, um, they managed to establish themselves a colony down um, in London. Um, I think it was back in the in the 70s. There's, there's rumours around how they got there, but they've uh, managed to find themselves uh, being very comfortable living in our climate and making themselves very comfortable. Um, I've started to see them. I live in Stourbridge and I've started to see them uh, in Stourbridge now. In fact, there's one that's um, managed to make friends with a pair of wood pigeon um, and likes to hang out in my garden with a pair of wood pigeon, which really amuses me. Um, so they're quite they're, they're quite noisy. They're, 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 they're bustly. They, they, they make a lot of noise. Um, yeah, and they are starting now to show up more often uh, in, our, in our parks and in our gardens. It's interesting to see where you've all spotted them. So some of the birds that we've talked about on the other slides um, that you might also commonly see in your garden, some of them can be quite easy to overlook as well. So on the top left here, we've got the chaffinch. This is a male chaffinch. The female chaffinch is very brown, quite almost quite sort of dull. Um, quite muted sort of colours, but the chaffinch has got this very buff chest and it's very sort of pencil, pencil slaty grey head. You might see those in your garden. And we mentioned the goldfinch, of course, here. Now, the goldfinch seem to have had a bit of a boom over the last few years, seem to be seeing them more and more often. Um, usually on um, bird feeders, they like to eat seeds. They've got the sharp pointy beak like they have, like the, like the chaffinch. They're all part of the finch family, so they like to eat seeds. So any bird seed feeders in your gardens, particularly what you call straight feeds, straight seeds like the Niger sheaths for seeds, for example, they particularly like those. And I never seen nuthatch in my garden, unfortunately. Uh, it's a little bit too urban. Um, but yeah, you might see the, um, the massive bandit going up or down the tree trunks here in your garden. Very colourful, very colourful birds. Love their behaviour. And um, I think probably one of everyone's favourites um, is the wren down here in the bottom in the middle. It's always got a sticky uppy tail. Very small, flits around, kind of hops, 
very very loud likes to shout at you <laughs> got a very shouty song we quite often see birds these are quite common birds in our garden and we mentioned the, the blackbird earlier in the presentation and uh, the st starlings as well and um starlings particularly like bird baths so if you have any water in your garden um great way to attract starlings to your to your garden they love having a wash they're very messy and they'll very very quickly empty the entire bird bath of water so let's just take a quick look at some of the birds that we might see quite commonly um, in our parks so dominantly parks where there's water for example so we've got some um we've got some different birds here just to go through with you um now the top two here we've got are the mallard um now i've popped these two in i suspect that most of you on the call will recognize the mallard um, but it came to my attention that some people didn't actually realise this was a female and a male. Um, some people actually thought they were completely different ducks, different species. So I thought I'll pop this in the presentation in case anybody doesn't know. This is the male mallard here with its very, very grand emerald green head. And the female is very, very brown. Still just as beautiful, but she's very, very brown. Um, over here on the right are two water birds that very often get mixed up. So the one is a little more browner and it has a red beak and a very red eye. And this one is a moor hen. Uh, and this particular bird actually um, can be seen um, on ponds of all different sizes uh, at, your, at your local parks. A little bit shyer, a little bit quieter birds. Um, the one that it gets a bit mixed up with, sometimes people get mixed up with, is a slightly bigger, much darker coloured with a completely white bill. It's a little bit more noisy, a little bit more boisterous, and that's the coot. So the coot has the white bill and the moor hen has the red bill. So you can remember that a little bit like the, the colour of, of chickens, so hens are a bit more colourful with the red bill. That might be helpful to, to remember the, the moor hen. Um, this bird here right at the top, does anybody know what this, this one is? Flying with its mouth open, it's got no manners, has it? Do you know what this one is? Almost, almost black, very dark brown. Cormorant. Cormorant, yeah, absolutely. So again, um, these, these birds can be seen um, at our parks quite commonly, uh, quite often with their wings stretched out, drying their wings, uh, but we can also see them on canals. We also see them uh, on wetlands. And our coastal areas. And then one of my favourites down in the bottom left, um, a quite petite duck, has a beautiful bright yellow eye, and it's named after its uh, unusual hairstyle, shall we say. So it has a bit of a Mohican going on, it's got this tuft of hair here at the back, and this is called a tufted duck. So you can quite often see this one just sort of floating away in a nice relaxed flat fashion on your local park. Look out for that tuft on the back of its head there. And here are some more birds that you might quite commonly see um, at parks. So on the top left here, a beautiful bird. Um, when they're in their mating season, they have a very elaborate mating dance, which again, I've never been able to see in the wild. I've only ever seen it on documentaries. Um, but they both swim down, they mirror each other, they mirror each other's movements, um, and they, they um, swim down and get bits of, um, bits of weeds from in the pond to present to their partners. It's beautiful. It's almost like watching grebe ballet. And this is a great crested grebe. And you can see it's got like crests on top of the head here. And behind it is the juvenile, great crested grebes. They're diving birds. So you might see them at your local, at your local ponds, at your local, local parks that have pools. So you might spot them out on the water, they will dive down and then they'll pop back up somewhere completely different. So you have to really keep your eyes peeled for those ones. Uh, this is, is a really easy to remember gull. Gulls are very complicated, I find, <laughs> gull identification. This one's a really simple one. They're really common. Um, they're quite noisy, they're quite chattery, they're really social. You see them in quite big groups. And in the summer, its whole head is completely black. It's a black-headed gull. Now, in the winter months, 
they lose what we call their summer, their, their summer breeding plumage, and that black head fades away to just a little dot behind its behind its. Uh, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing to my ear, so it's almost where you would imagine its ear is. So behind its eye, a little black dot. So they do look very different in the winter to what they do in the summer. They still have a bit of black, but not quite the full black head. Again, you'll see this in parks. Also see them um, in very um, urban in very urban parks as well. So city centre city centre parks as well, and quite quite often now in gardens and we've got the the grey heron down here um, which we might see on canal walks uh, if we have ponds in our garden we may also see them in our garden um, but they like they like to be around water because they will be um, looking for food such as fish and frogs that they will catch with their enormous big bill and they're very still birds they um, keep very very still sometimes you can look and think is that actually real is it it's not even moving there is, it's waiting for that opportunity to strike to catch its prey. Now we showed you the jay earlier in the presentation, the bird that you can you can see. Um, you we tend to see it more often um, in the um, in the autumn because they're very busy. You'll see you'll suddenly think, where have all these jays come from? Why are they all suddenly around? Just because they're busier, so you get to see them more. You'll quite often see them burying um, burying acorns, which is a behaviour known as caching. So it's saving food when the food is scarce in the winter months, you tend to see them more in the autumn. Uh, and then two different sorts of geese here. So these are two different types of geese, two different species of geese that you might see at local parks. The top one is quite a soft brown with an orange bill. This one is known as a grey lag goose, a grey lag goose. And then a goose that I just suspect almost everybody is familiar with, very, very common goose. These are Canada geese. Um, very noisy. <laughs> they are very noisy, when, especially when they're coming into land. They're very talkative. They talk to each other. Very social birds. Yeah, very long black neck, the black head, and the the brown the brown body there. So that's some that's some ideas for you when it comes to spotting the local birds. And I've just got a few tips for you when it comes to learning about birds. So I've only really been into birds for probably around about ten years. Um, I'm by no means an expert in birds. I will quite often see a bird and think, I have no idea what that is. Um, but it's a journey of learning, I always find. You know, so sometimes you will think you need to go back and find out when I get home what that bird is. Um, and learning can take many forms. Um, so a good pair of binoculars can be great for bird watching. You don't necessarily need to spend thousands and thousands of pounds. You can even buy a decent pair of binoculars for less than hundred pounds. Um, I wish I had a telescope. I don't have one. Uh, I'd love to get myself a bird watching telescope, but they're great tools for just being able to get a close look at a bird without disturbing it and its natural habitat. And you can see on the screen now on the bottom left is a really awful photograph. Now I will take credit for that really awful photograph because it's one that I took. Um, and this is where photography it can come in really helpful with learning your bird identification. You're not quite sure what it is and you happen to be out and about and you've got your camera phone with you or you've got your actual a proper camera with you take a snap you know don't intrude the bird too much get back home and see if you can have a look later uh, and there's also a technique that some of you might be familiar with which is called digiscoping or digibinning uh, which is essentially where you use the camera on your smartphone and you line it up to the um, lens on your binoculars or to your telescope a bit fiddling you almost need an extra person or an extra pair of hands to line things up and, and uh, get it all focused um, but that really awful photograph that I've included there is um, a red wing that I spotted in my garden last winter um, and I kept telling my friend I've no red wing in my garden and I kept saying your garden I don't think so I thought I'm gonna get a photograph of this red wing so I did with my binoculars and the camera I said look there's a red wing in my garden and yes it's a terrible photograph it's not going to win any awards um, but it just was a useful, uh, is a useful mechanism for me just to be able to, to identify and to confirm what it was really. But there's a variety of different books and guides um, out there. Um, if you are fairly new to watching birds, then there are some what we call concise guides, so such as the Bloomsbury guides that I've, that I've shown here on the right. Uh, much smaller, sort of pocket sized, uh, wouldn't necessarily list every bird that you are most likely to see, but more of the common birds. And also on our website, we sell, fold out field guides to um, some of the more common garden birds as well with big colorful illustrations on, they're very useful. If you're looking for a more complete guide, 
personally, I'd recommend this book, which is the Collins Bird Guide. Um, I have that here on my shelf. It's fantastic. It gives a guide to all of the really common birds that you would find across Britain and Europe. So it's really helpful if you spot a bird that's here that shouldn't be here. And it's just gone off course. Uh, really, really useful, really useful book. Uh, and there are also guides um, and books, such as I mentioned earlier, David Lindo has to be an urban bird, as you see there with the cover. Um, with, a, with a jackdaw there filling its beak with eyes um, and, and David's a real advocate for you can see birds anywhere you don't have to go into the countryside you know you get around our local urban areas and we'll, we'll see birds social media is a great tool as well you know you might you might find um go onto twitter go onto facebook if you've got a photograph that you've taken especially if, if you're digiscoping for example or bird just in your garden share it with us with the trust after we're going to be sharing our social media slides social media links shortly um we can help you with that identification uh, and there's also a tool on our website known as the wildlife explorer if you think there's a certain bird species of any other species that you've seen have a search for it on our website and find out more about it your birds as well you're going to find out more you've been finding out more about them you've been learning about them and we need you to love them too um, so there's two great, two great ways you can do that. And one is to create habitats um, and the other is to feed them. Um, um, some of you may know to, that it's best to avoid bread. Um, bear, uh, birds love bread, but it's not very good for them. Um, uh, birds in our gardens, um, you can get uh, wild bird seed. And we would recommend a supplier called Vinehouse Farm. They are partners of the Wildlife Trust uh, and they actually make a donation every time you make a purchase. Um, so no matter where in the UK you live, uh, if you make a, a purchase from them, if you're a new customer, they will donate £10 to your local Wildlife Trust. And then they'll also donate 4% of the sales um, to your local Wildlife Trust as well. And they are great quality bird feed. I do genuinely buy from them myself. Um, if you're going to the local park and you want to feed the ducks, you know, bread's a no-no. But what you can feed your ducks at the local park is um, quite cheaply is things like sweet corn and lettuce and oats. So you don't have to cook any of these. You can just take some sweet corn out of the freezer, let it defrost a little bit, and give them some sweet corn. They love it with some lettuce and, and oats. And if you're brave enough, stick them in your hand, let them eat that in your hand. And actually, water is really important. So if you're feeding your birds, they're going to want to drink. Um, so putting bird feeders out and clean, keeping those bird feeders clean as well. Um, important to make sure you clean both your um, water feeding stations and your feeding stations like your seed feeding stations um, to prevent disease. Um, it's actually been a bit of a problem for green finch. They've been getting just, um, viruses from bird feeders and that's been a part of so their decline in certain areas. Uh, it's particularly important to do so in January and May. You don't need any specialist skills, you just need a bucket and some warm soapy water, give it a good scrub, a bottle brush is great. I use a big bottle brush to clean the feeders, give them a good rinse, pop them back out again, make it part of your, your regular routine. And creating habitats. So whether it's building a box or whether it's um, actually just having plenty of spaces, natural spaces in your gardens, and um, such as hedges and trees uh, in order for your birds to find somewhere to nest. Now you may know um, that we've been running a series of these uh, series of events. Um, to help you with identification. This is the third in the series. Um, my colleagues have delivered events on identification of hoverflies and identification of bees, recordings of which um, are on our YouTube page. Um, and the reason for that is because we're trying to encourage as many people as possible to get involved with citizen science. So citizen science is essentially where you, as a member of the public, um, can submit your wildlife records that get added to our biological database that helps us with monitoring species populations and helps us with producing our strategic plans where we plan our projects. And it's very, very simple to do. Um, all throughout the year, you can send us your species records either by contacting um, Eco Record, which is our local um, environmental record centre, um, email them, contact them on Twitter or on Facebook, or by using an, an app called the iNaturalist app which I'm going to talk to you about more about in a second. And there's just four things that we need to know. We need to know what you saw, where you saw it, when you saw it, 
and who it was. So that's obviously that's just you. So what, where, when and who. Now, in just a few days time, we are taking part in a global citizen science challenge. This is called the City Nature Challenge. It starts next Friday, which is the bank holiday weekend, and it goes all the way through the Monday. It's essentially, it's a fun and simple way that everybody can get involved with citizen science. It's completely free to take part. And you simply use um, the free app called the iNaturalist app, or you go to the iNaturalist website. If you're using your smartphone, you can download the app, really user-friendly, and you simply take a photograph of any species that you see over those four-day periods. Of course, do it all the time anyway, because citizen science is great, but particularly during this four-day period, any particular wildlife, so whether that's fungus or whether it's flowers or whether it's tree, bird, mammal, insect, amphibian, any different species counts. And the reason we're so keen for you to take part is twofold. Firstly, as I previously said, that all of that data is really vital for us um, in understanding species population, um, as well as contributing towards our strategic ecological plans. But the other reason we really wanted to take part is that last year, um, Birmingham and the Black Country as an area, um, which we coordinate the entry for alongside the Birmingham Museums Trust, came, uh, came top in Europe for the amount of species recorded, the different number of species recorded. So we're really just demonstrating, and we were so proud to demonstrate how rich in biodiversity our urban areas can be. And this doesn't mean that you know, our, urban area, our urban areas, everything's fine, and that we don't need to continue to protect nature, because obviously it's there, we have to go looking for it. Um, but we are really keen to hold on to, to, hold on to that title. So if you register, um, if you want to register for updates, head to our website and uh, we're sending out emails in the run up to the Citizen Challenge. And we're also choosing 20 people who register at random to win a free bag as well. So here's just some ideas of what you can do to get involved with the City Nature Challenge. So you could just literally go for a walk from your house. So right, I'm going to walk from the house to the shop. That's what I did last year. And on my walk from the house to the shop, just record as many different species as you can see. Now, if you can get a photograph of it, fantastic. But if you are 100% certain that you know the species that you have seen, you can just type the name of the species into the app. The great thing about the app, though, is it has species recognition. So if you take a photograph and you're not really sure what that species is you're looking at, the app will help you to identify what species it is that you're looking at and other people using the app. Um, will actually contribute and contact you to give you some advice as well. So you could have a look for things like um, where are the weeds, for example, you know, make a list of all the plants that are in your garden naturally. So things like your, um, your dandelion, do a bird count, write down, write down all the species of birds that visit your garden over that particular time. Uh, if you have a local pond or a pond in your garden, use the use a net to discover the wildlife that lives in there. There's loads of different ways um, to take part in City Nature Challenge. And it also happens to fall at the same time as International Dawn Chorus Day, which takes place on this Sunday um, of every May. Um, and it was actually uh, uh, coined here in, in Birmingham at mostly bog back in the 80s. So that's the end of my presentation uh, with regards to an introduction to bird identification. Um, but I just wanted to take the opportunity for those of you who aren't members of the Trust, um, just to urge you and encourage you to consider joining us as a member of the Trust. I know some of you on this call are members. Hello, thank you for joining us and thank you for your support. Membership is a really vital income source for our work for Nature's Recovery for Birmingham and the Black Country. And you'll be joining a community of over 7,200 other passionate people that support our work. And membership can start from as little as £3 per month. And we will um, send you four magazines per year, uh, as well as invitations to special member-only events. And we do also offer a Wildlife Watch membership, which is suitable for families uh, with children. Lots of interactive activities, posters, Butter sheets and stickers for children to get involved in as well. And just here upon the screen is all the different ways that you can stay in touch with us. So we are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. 
you can watch recordings of our events and other videos on our YouTube channel. And if you're not already signed up to our newslet newsletter, do head across to our website and click on the sign up link to register to get our regular emails.